Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name's Dr. James Gill and welcome to another clinical skills video. Um, this week is um, how should I put it, a slightly responsive video. Um, the previous video we put out looked at the deep dive of the spinal examination, looking at each part of the examination, crucially why we're doing it. However, one very eagle-eyed viewer noticed that um, the patient's um, limb reflex was ever so slightly different. His left leg responded slightly more so than his right. So that got me thinking, that's probably a useful teaching opportunity to look at the differences that might, or things that might affect a reflex. So with that in mind, um, a reflex has five features, if you will, and also five components, so it makes it quite nice to get in our heads. So what are the five features of a, uh, a reflex? Well, it needs to be rapid, so it's going to happen very, very quickly. It happens to be involuntary, so it's got to happen without conscious thought. There has to be an activator, so something actually comes in to say, hey, here's the stimulus. It must have a, a gland or a tissue that is activated and it also must be about maintaining homeostasis or reducing damage or injury to the individual. That one's a little bit broader there. So we've talked about the five features that there are for a, um, a reflex, but it's got to have five components that are the things that it is made up of. So there's the receptor, the thing that says, you went out. There's the sensory fibre, the thing that transmits the message that you went out. There's going to be the control fibre, which says, yep, we need to act on this thing that made us go out. We need to have the um, motor neurone, the thing that says, get away from it. And we need to actually have the motor itself, which takes you away from the thing that made you go out. So we can see it's all about, going back to what I said about the features, it's about protecting the homeostasis, protecting the body, preventing injury going on. So, again, my, my brain is wired slightly different than normal. Do you know what, do you know what I think you could argue is a, an example of a reflex? The Incredible Hulk. Okay, hold on. Bear with me for a second here. So... Bruce Banner changing into the Hulk is very, very rapid. It's involuntary. He doesn't have control of when the Hulk's out, as it were. And I'm a huge fan of the way you lose control and turn into an enormous green rage monster. It's in response to a stimuli. So Bruce is tired, he's angry, he's stressed, he's injured, he's knocked out, for example. We've got the tissue, we've got the gland, we've got Bruce's whole body becoming the Hulk. And, you know, we've got the output, so he's going to hopefully protect uh, Bruce from injury. Well, he should do. The Hulk is practically invulnerable. So, yeah, maybe it's um, over-egging a metaphor, but actually I think that works if we view those five features of a reflex. OK, admittedly, we, we, I think we'd stretch it too far if we tried to talk about the five components of the reflex, but it's there nevertheless. So with that in mind, before we carry on any further, let's just grab one of the models and have a look at what we're dealing with when we talk about a reflex arc. So here's a view of our spinal column if we cut it in half, but we want to focus specifically on the spinal cord. So let's zoom in there a moment. Looking at the spinal cord um, and out to the body, we've got the receptor, so the finger goes ouch and we detect whatever that is. So we've got mechanical energy, and that's transduced into electricity, and that signal is going to shoot down our nerves, our sensory neurons. This is our afferent neuron, thinking A for attention, and that's going to take this signal and pass it into the spine. Through the horn cell and across the spine, so this is short-circuiting, if you will, the brain, hence it being an involuntary action, and we're going to go through that control or integration or an intern uh, neuron in the spine. That will bounce things across to the efferent neuron, thinking exit, and this is the motor neuron, which will run all the way through to the muscle fibres, which are the effectors. And that's going to mean you know, our muscles contract, pulling our hand away. So that's really quite simple. 
So going back to the, the point we're supposed to be talking about, a reflex arc here. So David is many things, but he isn't quite the Hulk. We wrapped on one knee with our tendon hammer and we saw a reasonable reflex. We wrapped on the other and that was slightly reduced. Now, in reality, that's because David fractured um, his leg on the affected side, and that's just the muscles and things don't work quite as well as they should do. So that's why he's not seeing that same level. But we do know that there's two big um, divisions, if you will, um, big, two different classifications that we want to pay attention to if we've got a change in reflex, that being an upper and a lower motor neuron lesion. Now we've touched on these a little bit in one of the uh, cranial nerve videos, particularly when we're talking uh, about cranial nerve 7 with the facial nerve there. However, um, those same um, issues with an upper or motor neuron lesion are going to affect any reflex that we have. So with an upper motor neuron lesion, we have everything is increased. So we've got hypertonia, uh, we've got hyperreflexia, and we've also got spasticity of the muscle. So it's much less easy to move it. Conversely, with a lower motor neuron lesion, everything decreases. We've got lower tone, lower reflexes, and we've got flaccidity to the muscles. And we see that, as we mentioned, on the reflex. With our upper motor neuron lesion, we get short, sharp uh, reflexes, but with a lower motor neuron, we get a slower rising reflex. So what's going to determine whether or not we're looking at an upper motor neuron or a lower motor neuron? With an upper motor neuron, this is something that's going to be an injury between the motor cortex and the ventral horn of the spinal column. Conversely, a lower motor neuron lesion is any injury from the ventral horn of the spinal column out to the effector muscle. And when we understand that, we can see the differences in the features that we get. So with our upper motor neuron lesion, we get increased reflexes. That seems strange. Why would potentially a, a, a brain injury cause reflexes to increase? Well, actually, here's, here's where um, things break down over so slightly. With our upper motor neuron, that will allow suppression of excess movement normally. So when we've removed that, we don't get that inhibition to um, the reflex, so it doesn't overfire. Hence, we get a very brisk, a very sharp reflex. Conversely, with our lower motor neuron, the reflex arm is literally broken. With our upper motor neuron lesion, we're losing control of it. With our lower motor neuron lesion, we're breaking the arc. So something on the efferent pathway, somewhere from the ventral horn all the way out to the muscle, the nerve is broken, and like a break in a circuit, we can't get that signal anymore. Okay, so David said that he um, injured his leg, he broke his leg in the past. So let's actually exacerbate that a little bit. Let's give him that lower motor neuron lesion. So we wrap on his knee, there's our, um, our sensor, with, um, we have the message transmitted down the afferent neuron. It goes into the spine, crosses over the interneuron, comes out again down the afferent fibre and, and goes into the muscle, the effector. Now, because of his um, injury, we're going to say that the effector, the muscle, is impacted. So our lower motor neuron injury is resulting in a reduced reflex. I mean, realistically, the, the best way of thinking about a lower motor neuron lesion is you've literally cut the connections. Um, you know, you've got damage to the axon in some way, shape or form, and the circuit just does not complete, thus you get no reflex. By comparison with our upper motor neuron lesion, it's not that the reflex arc is no longer present, it's that the higher functions, the suppression, the fine control has been lost, hence we have that hyperreflexivity. There are a few other things that will affect this. So hypothyroidism will cause a slow rising reflex because there we've got an effect on the muscle and the transduction of the nerve fibers is reduced. So you can argue that's going to give that's why we're getting that appearance of a lower motor neuron. Conversely with 
hyperthyroidism, we can get brisk reflexes because everything is cranked to the, um, to the max. So it's kind of like uh, mimicking an upper motor neuron lesion where we've lost the inhibition from the circuit. So let's wrap this up then. You've not got a tenor and a hammer at home. Is there an easy reflex that you can go and see without, you know, perhaps touching something hot or unpleasant? Yes. Go have a look in the mirror and look in your eye and shine a torch to the eye. As we've discussed in one of the cranial nerve uh, videos, here you're seeing cranial nerve 2, the, um, the optic nerve, and cranial nerve 3, the ocular motor nerve, working as a reflex arc. Light is travelling in through the retina, goes into uh, cranial nerve 2, into the um, uh, reflex arc, and comes back down on the cranial nerve 3 as the afferent uh, neuron, causing the pupil to constrict. So there's a really simple reflex for you to test at home. Well, I hope that very simple overview of a, a reflex has helped. Um, and if you'd like us to try and expand on any other parts that you've seen in our deep dive videos, please give us a comment down below and we'll see if we can do another of these supplementary videos. Thanks for watching this far. If it's been useful, please subscribe and we'll see you on the next one. Take care. See you later.